one person in particular who's very, very erudite, very, very educated, very caring, spiritual. Uh, it's an older woman, and she told, she gave me the greatest text I could have ever received, which is the design of the book. She literally said, I felt so much anxiety. She has grandkids, and she sees what's happening. And um, she said, I, I've had such great, great anxiety about the direction of the church and the culture. And she said, after finishing the book, she said, I feel great hope. It's a book of great, great hope because why it's going to be God's direct intervention. That's what this is about. The whole world is sick. Are you worried about America? I am. Believe the impossible and you can do the incredible. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Catholic Patriot. And gosh, we're in for a good ride on this podcast, uh, which is going to be two parts for sure. And uh, it's, it's a blessing to welcome back Ted Flynn. I'm going to put Ted on the right side of the screen here. And Ted joins us from uh, near the belly of the beast in Washington, D.C. He's in Virginia. And Ted and his wife, Maureen, are the, the founders of... Signs and Wonders. It's a magazine that I grew up with when I was young that had a big influence on my own life um, because it was always talking about the signs of the times. And I woke, I grew up in New Jersey. This is kind of in a bubble, but my mother started telling me about all these things and the going on in the world. Our Lady <clears throat> you know, appearing in Medjugorje and all these places. And I was like, what's going on? Well, she always had a copy of this magazine. And so I have it in my room. It started putting pieces together for me. And it had a big influence because one of the big things that God has had me do throughout my life since then has been helping connect the dots for so many people, theologically, spiritually, historically. And Ted is a, a guest that I, I've had on before. Ted is an expert, and I use that word uh, not loosely. You know, we hear everybody's an expert today on things, but he really is in this subject that we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking about the apparitions and the message of Garibandal, Spain. And he's dedicated, as, as, he, as Ted was telling me, 40 years of his life over that, um, understanding these messages. So, Ted, I want to welcome you to our podcast. And, well, right here it's Arctic weather. I'm not sure if you have it yet, but uh, hopefully you're staying nice and warm. Well, I am warm, but they're saying cold weather's coming. <laughs> and if the snow stays away, I saw on your, as the camera was moving around, you've got snow outside. We don't have any, and that's fine. You can have it all. Well, we have, we don't have too much snow, but we have uh, negative 12 degrees right now. So we, negative we have the Arctic. 12. Yep. Wow. The, this, this polar vortex, as they would always call it, has finally come through overnight. And it was a windy night very windy debris everywhere and just total craziness and uh for for the next few days we have highs in the sub zeros so it's coming your way so much for global warming <laughs> yeah i know well ted uh once once again it's great to have you with us and this subject of garamandal in 2024 and in the beginning of this right now in january is kind of the big buzz for some people, they're maybe jumping on a, a bandwagon because uh, more and more people are talking about various prophetic aspects of it. Um, and the other thing, though, is that as we'll be talking about, there's a lot of things that are aligning historically that are tied into things that have been said within these messages and interviews with the visionaries um, since the 1960s. So, Ted... First, what um, what 
got you into Garamandol? Like, why Garamandol? Because there's Medjugorje, there's Fatima, there's Akita Japan, there's so many other Marian apparitions. And sometimes, you know, Garamandol seems to be one that is given some attention, but also there's kind of a hands off because others, many people don't know too, like, what is the status of Garamandol? Some think it's been condemned or given, an, you know, just a non approval. And my research has revealed that it's been really a neutral stance from the Bishop of Santander for some time, but nobody talks about that. So which opens the door for Catholics to have devotion. The messages can have an impact on their life. They can make pilgrimages there. So why Garamandal? And then within that, if you can let us know too, like what is the status of Garamandal? Garamandal has always been my pet for economic reasons, for eschatology reasons, for a geopolitical understanding. I had been in Spain and Portugal even in the late 70s. I understood the geography, everything from northern Spain and the Basque area. But for me, it's where the planets aligned. I, you could see where the world was going if you knew any of the history of previous civilizations. You would know where the United States was going. So for me, things just clicked. Now, you mentioned some of uh, the apparition sites. Over the last 35 years, which is how long we've had our magazine, we have probably done articles on nearly every major visionary and every major Catholic site that you can even think of. We have five board feet of publication. So we've done an enormous amount of, of, uh, of publication. And a lot of our stuff has been originally created to where then other people have created, uh, used it, and that's all fine and dandy. It's the purpose of why we do what we do. And other people, you know, use a lot of that material because it's original content. But now to, the, so it's always been my pet. Uh, I've been to Medjugorje four times, La Salette, uh, you know, Guadalupe, Rue de Bac, uh, the only major site I have never been to is probably Akita, Japan, Guadalupe, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, to the issue of, of its canonical stat status, there's actually three, th three places for it. And this is all in the book, incidentally. Everything we're talking about that we will be addressing is all in the book. Today is the actual release date of your book on Garabandal. Uh, i put it right there in the middle of our screen here, and I'll kind of cover my face just with a little bit right about there. But you have Garabandal, The Warning and the Great Miracle, and then the subtitle, I'll make it a little bit bigger, The Divine Reset That Will Correct the Conscience of the World. So as what we're going to be talking about in, uh, in our conversation is going to be what everyone's going to find in greater depth in this book. So I'm just, I'm sorry I didn't mention that right in the beginning. We we talked for all, about it all during the pre-show. Um, but this is a, a historic moment because this has been a, a big, big project for Ted. He's been a recluse for, I think, at least a year trying to get this done. So didn't want to interrupt there, but other this is important. I'm going to, if you don't mind, just for a little while, I'm going to put it on the screen. So go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it, the book arrived physically today, which is always a nice thing after you've been working on something and you see the physical copy. I created 20 copies for people to proof it, and they did. And to to come to the punchline, um, the uh, one person in particular who's very, very erudite, very, very educated, very caring, spiritual, uh, it's an older woman, and she told she gave me the greatest text I could have ever received, which is the design of the book. She literally said, I felt so much anxiety. She has grandkids, and she sees what's happening. And um, she said, I, I've had such great, great anxiety about the direction of the church and the culture. And she said, after finishing the book, she said, I feel great hope. It's a book of great, great hope because why it's going to be God's direct intervention. That's what this is about. This, this isn't going to go on forever. And that, so let's get to your question of its canonical status that you asked. No bishop since 1961 has ever condemned it or approved it. They've simply left it alone. But with every passing bishop, which I think since 1961, 
I think there's either six or seven, and I list them all when they were made bishop and when a new bishop came in from Santander. And in 2011, um, the bishop actually gave his per permission for masses to be said there. And in 2012, he actually, the Bishop of Santander said a mass there. So I give all of the dates of when they were Bishop of Santander and their status of it. So it's never been um, condemned or disapproved. And I think there are several reasons for that. I have a section in the book called what some notables have thought of it. And I think it's been actually protected. We, we know I have a great deal of information on what Padre Pio said and did in his actions. He approved of it. He saw the miracle before he died. It came out. He told a priest he, he actually saw the miracle that was prophesied. We know Mother Teresa was very supportive of it. We have people like Father Walter Chiswick and others that are very supportive of it who had lived a life of suffering in the Soviet gulag. And I have a list of what a lot of notables said. Um, Mother Teresa was, was engaged with the visionaries personally at several locations, knew Conchita and was supportive. And Mother Angelica, um, when she was healed, I think after 42 years yeah. of leg braces, the one place she went to everywhere in the world, she was very devoted to the infant of Prague and other things. But the place that she went to give thanks was Garabandal. Mm. So I think that because some very like people, Paula six, that it's if, that it's the great it's the greatest story literally since the resurrection. Uh, and, and Paula six had said several things. And these quotes are all there. John Paul II endorsed a book on Garabandal, so we know he was supportive and said to promote it, and he said congratulations to the alt author. And so I think to a certain degree it's been protected. That's my feeling. Mm. And that mm. Rome hasn't, or the local bishop hasn't condemned it. It's just, it's, it's in the limbo phase. They leave it alone. And, and, sure. and by the way, I think that's very prudent of the church to do that. Three of the four of the, of the, of the, of the women are still living. Mary yeah. Lowley died in April of 2009, and she was the only person who knew the year of the warning. And uh, we will get into this a little bit later at some length. It's Conchita who knows who has released to the world some of the specifics about the miracle. Interesting. And there's, quite, there's a lot more data on the mm -hmm. miracle than there is on the warning. Well, I look forward to getting into that. You know, I, think, I think it's important for, for many you know, who are watching to realize that there are a number of approved apparitions. I mean, there's there's quite a few. But as far as, far as the ones that are ongoing and or have a, these, uh, pr uh, a prophetic nature where there are secrets that are involved, unless... The Holy Father knows what they are, or whatever. Like somebody, an ecclesiastical authority, like would know what they are. It's almost impossible for the Church to give a kind of approval. Um, and I, I think even what you were hinting at too is that these things too, uh, a prophetic warning, a miracle. When we're talking about that, a permanent sign, it, it, they will authenticate this by the, the nature of what happens. The question, though. And this is kind of what leading into now the, the story of Garabandal is it's not this uh, as if we're on an infinite timer. Like you were saying, these things are going there. There's a, there's a beginning, you know, there's a middle and then there's an end. And we're uh, so many things are pointing to like, we're at the end, you know, even so many prophetic figures, including Fulton Sheen. I always use the quote. He said that we are at the end of an era. Final, you know, uh, St. John Paul II, we're in the final confrontation. And sometimes we almost get fatigued because we kind of think, oh gosh, though, that was said 80 years ago. That was said uh, 50 years ago. And um, But it's evident right before our eyes. And the story of Garamanda, I think, is interesting because um, Fulton Sheen was known to say that God doesn't do anything in history without the greatest finesse of detail. And he was speaking about Fatima, um, and really that applies to all the Marian apparitions, in particular this one. So, Ted, can you set the stage for us of the the historical stage of 
these apparitions that began in 1961 and they went until was it 64 or 65? Basically, 65. yeah, basically the years of the Second Vatican Council, um, and um, and then help us to, to to connect some of these dots. You know what, what's what's significant about that timing, um, so we can we can have a better idea. Well, you get into the historical. You know, you couldn't. Uh, it's funny you say that because um, until you understand some of the historical, you can't understand why it happened there and why it happened then. And for a person to have ever lived in the 1860s, they would have never m missed the American Civil War, you know, which um, you, you could see the prelude of it. And even John Adams said the last act of the signing of the Declaration of Independence will be the emancipation of, of, of slavery. So and, and yet it took a, a long, long time for that to happen from the Revolutionary War all the way to the American Civil War. Something that I, I put a disproportionate amount of material in to set the stage on just that issue of the historical is the Spanish Civil War. You cannot understand Spain until you understand the Spanish Civil War. It was the Nationalists versus the Republicans. Um, which you had Franco siding with the Nazis, and then you had Stalin write that, you know, Lenin had died in 1924. This may seem like a little bit of a tangent to some, but the people who proofed the book for me, it, ma it made Garabindal much more understandable on why. Mm -hmm. Key, key issue. Why Garabindal and why then? And so what happened is... Um, over 8,000 clergy were murdered by the communists in Spain. 8,000, 13 bishops, nuns, priests, a lot of them fled to France. And it's, uh, communism was er, uh, rearing its ugly head. And at that time, Stalin was, was very much looking to make the world communist. So he had been sending armaments and troops and, and all sorts of strategic things for the Spanish communists. And so it, it, it lasted from 1936 to 39, which is more than three and a half years total when you look at the months of starting and ending. And there wasn't a person in Spain who, who did not know of it or was directly involved in it. Now, Garabandal in Northwest Spain is a very, very remote village. It was, to, to put that in perspective, uh, when it happened in 1961, it was 22 years after the Spanish Civil War. But the, the spirituality of, of Spain is in the north. Teresa of Avila is from the north. Burgos is in the north. Um, Ignatius of Loyola, Dominic was all in the north, the seminaries, and more towards the Madrids and the Barcelona, is, is they were much more communist. And so it was the Basque area in the north, and even the northern Spain all around that area, they considered themselves really a part of southern um, of France and they in, in a good portion as much as one quarter to a third of the people going to Lord considered themselves part of that apparition that that was the fidelity of the north and so their families all knew of it they had been suffering and they lived their faith and there the Angelus was said if you're ready for this several hundred years daily with, with the announcement of a bell so the, the, you go back to Fulton Sheen's finesse and the details. There was great fidelity in the village. And to put it how primitive or, or lack of sophistication in terms of the world, in 1961, there was not a motor with a moving part in the village of Garabandal. Not a motor. And, and, and literally years later, in 1969, the United States sent a man to the moon and brought them home safely. So there was a great dichotomy in terms of what would be considered much more elementary with sophistication and living versus a lot of the Western world. Garabandal, Spain is one of the places I was blessed to go to back in 1995. We did Lourdes and then uh, Garabandal, Spain, and then Fatima. And just getting to this little village way up high 
and you know taking trains and all of these things and we literally had to hike up the long road up the mountain to get to this little village which ended up being like a few streets <laughs> We, we were glad that it was actually Garb and Dahl because we felt like we were in the middle of nowhere and we like it like time had stopped in this town. It felt almost as if I was back in the 1960s. It was dead silent, hardly any lights. So just to, to your point, even to this very day, it remains that. Well, it's funny. Um, in, uh, my first trip there was in October of 1994. And um, I had never been there previously. We led a, a group and we were doing kind of the, you know, the Fatima, um, uh, Nazare, Santiago over to Santander. And Santander is about 50 minutes from, from Garabandal. But it, 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 it's remote. It's in the Cantabrian Mountains. It's a natural amphitheater looking down mm -hmm. on the nine pines to where you could literally see millions there to journey there and still be able to have an, an amphitheater type seat, a stadium type seat looking down on it. And the thing that stunned all of us, we had two priests and two buses. We had a hundred people and every single person felt that everybody felt that Fatima was true. They knew the message, but they also felt that it, it had all happened exactly Russia would become the scourge of the earth and, and all of the messages happened as said and you could look back on it historically and see its accuracy but everybody felt the cheese had moved to Garabandal that Garabandal was going to be the place where events would happen in the future and it, you could feel the mysticism and it really didn't look that much different than it did in 1994 when I was there and to put it in perspective, if, as you come out of the church, anybody who's been there recently, right as you come out of the small church, which has never been upgraded, never, never enlarged or anything, it's still very, very tiny, the original things, there's only two bathrooms, two. So, you know, uh, how is it going to deal with these crowds? The answer is nobody knows. And I have a lot of personal opinions on what's going to happen that I don't voice sure. publicly because they could be so outrageous for people. But, um, and it's like, um, you know, Father Andreu is going to, you know, it was said that he would, um, um, he would be incorrupt when his body was dug up. And so they, the Jesuits had moved him once and his body had already been corrupt. And so they asked Conchita once, they said, well, his body is incorrupt. And then Conchita said, well, it's not the day of the miracle yet. You know, so, the story is absolutely fantastic. When I was going, I went through three phases I actually, to finish this. I, I did a massive data dump of a lot of the material that I've written over the last 30 years on the subject of several hundred pages from different standpoints, pulling that together. And then, you know, and so it was just all sorts of material going in in the next phase. And that was the phase where I personally was overwhelmed. When you look at all of this data in vis-a-vis -vis Fatima um, of, of some of the things that have been said at other apparition sites, but I made a, 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 an absolute effort to stay away to try to validate Garabandal with other apparition sites. Garabandal is, has to live or die on its own. And no matter what I say, isn't really going to change that. So. <laughs> But so I didn't get into mixing and matching other apparition sites, but in one section I did using the number 18 specifically as it relates to Medjugorje. But I didn't want to have to validate uh, using Fatima or anything else with Garabandal because mm -hmm. it, 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 and, 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 and we talked earlier, I think the church should wait before approval of this to see if these things do happen as stated. Right, but but the material, frankly, when you see it all in one place, the historical, the enemy heaven fights with groups like what the Blessed Mother's battling with the United Nation types organization, the World Economic Forum, um, World Health Organization, and a lot of the organizations that have an agenda for very spiritually aberrant behavior. Um, this is what heaven fights, and, and that's put in there. So the material, frankly, takes your breath away when you see yeah. it all in one place.
Well, let's look at that. Let's kind of do almost like uh, you know a thirty thousand foot overview, uh, looking down on the history of these events that are obviously the you know, the apparitions took place over four years, um, and you know there our lady uh, there, there's four girls that are involved. What is the story? How can how can we just understand from when Saint Michael first appears, the archangel, in on June 18, nineteen sixty one, and to kind of summarize that, and then we can start doing a little bit of a deep dive into, I think the 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 areas that I think a lot of people are trying to find more understanding about. Well, let's give a broad overview um, of of the thirty thousand feet, and it goes right down right to the rudimentary elements, actually, very very quickly. The Blessed Mother appeared over four years and four months at a time that was absolutely contemporaneous with Vatican II meeting at the same time. And one of those messages that she said that the mass would be suppressed. Now, in, in, in 1961, the only mass at that time was the traditional Latin mass. And I found the word suppressed an interesting word. I always personally thought that the word suppression is that if we were together and I just kind of grabbed your arm or something and put a little pressure on it, that's suppression. It, if you go to the dictionary, that is one of them, but it goes all of the way to the word decimate, which really did surprise me. So if you go to a dictionary, you'll see that. And um, so it, it, there are just so many things that happened. But in June 18, 1961, the archangel appears to the four girls. There's, there's four of them, three of them at 12, and the youngest is Mary Cruz at 11. She is the only one who actually stayed in Spain and still lives there. And three out of the four girls married Americans. Mary Lowley died in, in 2009. Um, Jacinta married a, a man by the name of Moynihan who was in the Navy in California. And Conchita to this day lives in New York. So then on June 1st, St. Michael announces that Our Lady would appear as the Lady, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Now, that's the first time in the history of apparitions Our Lady has ever come under a biblical name, which is kind of interesting. And then, because what, what happened at Mount Carmel? You know, it, it, it's, it's where Elijah literally fought the false prophets. And then on July, so she said, uh, St. Michael said that she would appear as a lady of Mount Carmel in the very next day, July 2, on the Feast of the Visitation. But under the old calendar, it was actually the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, hmm. which is a very interesting thing. Because wherever the Ark of the Covenant was, is that Moses won his battles. She's coming for battle. I don't think that that day of July 2 back to the finesse of Sheen is an arbitrary date. And it's the Feast of the Visitation on our calendar. But there's two major messages early on. If you take a look at her appearing over 2,000 times, there isn't really the body of messages that you would think. Uh, be, be, there just wasn't a lot released. But on many, many occasions, the Blessed Mother spoke to the girls either jointly or individually for several hours at a time. And several of those sessions went all night long. And the girls always looked at them as a mother, as a confidant. They talked about their life and what they were. They were being discipled is what, what it was really happening. Think of an all night session with the Blessed Mother where you're talking just like we're talking, where nobody else could see it. And there were, there were instances when the Blessed Mother came, they would just get this interior feeling that the girls could never put words to. No matter where they were in the village, they would just know where to go at the same time. And they would all show up simultaneously to the exact same spot at the same time. And But it was always on the third time is when they left. So it, the girls could never put words to it. They just knew to go. So there's two main messages that I could read to be just very accurate mm -hmm. um, that are very, very prescient for this. The first one was on October 18th, major message, 1961. And I call these the bookends. And many sacrifices must be made. Many penances, penances must be done. We must make many, many visits to the Blessed Sacrament. But first of all, we must be good. If we do not do this, punishment awaits us. 
Already the cup is filling. That's the key phrase for this. Already the cup is filling. And if we do not change, we will be punished. So in other words, there's a conditional response here. That if, I call it the if-then clause in scripture. If my people do this then. Because it says, if we do not change. So now fast forward all the way pretty close to another four years. On June 18th, 1965, as the bookend closing on this message. Where the Blessed Mother said, as my message of October 18th, 1961, has not been complied with and has been made known to the world, I am advising you that this is the last one. Before the cup was filling, now it is flowing over. Many cardinals, many bishops, and many priests are on the road to perdition and are taking many souls with them. Less and less importance is being given to the Eucharist. So there you go. The cup is filling up. Now it's flowing over. Now, mind you, this just doesn't relate to the four girls in a small village with only several hundred people in northern Spain. This is for the world. So, again, at this time, Vatican II had just closed or was closing. So, yeah. you know, it, it, was it an arbitrary date for all of this? I don't know. You know, the listener and the viewer and the reader can decide that. And she said, you mm. should turn, turn the wrath of God away from yourselves by your efforts. If you ask his forgiveness with sincere hearts, he will pardon you. I, your mother, through the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel, ask you to amend your lives. You are now receiving the last warning. I love you very much and do not want your condemnation. Pray with us when, with sincerity and request. You should make more sacrifices. Think about the passion of Jesus. She literally just stated what the entire message of Garabandal is about. Amendment of life. So how can people have a struggle with this from an ideological standpoint? I've never really understood. All of the major apparition sites in history that are authentic, always, she always points to her son. They're all the same. There is no difference. And if there's a core message where a lot of things are said on individual messages, there are about two things. The priesthood and the, and the fidelity to the Eucharist, which was just mentioned there. That's it, the priesthood and the Eucharist, the core messages of in the amendment of life. So if that's a radical Catholic message, I've never found the radical element in it. It's so interesting, Ted, because this, as you're talking to, a lot of lights go on with, with me and connections, because it's, the message here in Garabendal is the same message that you find at Fatima, which... As as you were talking to about Our Lady of Mount Carmel, I I thought, wow, what an interesting uh, fact that right after the miracle of the sun, of the ways that Our Lady appeared to the children, one of them was as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and I think it had a greater significance than just the fact that Lucia would eventually become a Carmelite nun, because these apparitions and especially that time of the miracle every little thing is going to be is going to have great significance what an interesting connection because this message kind of fills in some of the some of the color i guess you can say of what was mentioned even in the secrets of fatima of uh what would be uh, the, the persecution and the things of the church but this is talking about you know within the church and I think it's interesting too because today we have the battle. I don't want to jump too much to the present right now, but you mentioned the dates. This is the the end of the Second Vatican Council, and so often in the in the split that exists today, not formally, but there's definitely like divisions within the Church right now between the Novus Ordo and the you know the traditionalists or the Rad Trads or whatever they are. I always find it interesting that. <clears throat> the issues that existed didn't just come out of Vatican II. These things pre-existed. Vatican II, you can say, was like the kerosene or whatever to light what was already, you know, bad wood or whatever it was. Um, and so, because a lot of times, like, it, it divides the church into, like, everything pre-Vatican II 
is was perfect. And we just need to go back to that where the issues were, were seriously in these major prophecies taking place when the Tridentine Mass was the only Mass. So anyway, not to have too much of a parenthesis there, but I do see find some interesting points of continuity, as you're going to see there. And then, even though we're not going to get into it here, Akita Japan, very, very similar, bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal. Um, and if mankind doesn't change, a, great, a terrible chastisement, worse than the deluge is going to happen. So it's interesting how we see our Blessed Mother couching these at the pivotal years of the Church in the modern world. Well, there's two things. I mean, you know, a lot of clergy, they don't find it a term of endear endearment where it says many cardinals, bishops, and priests are on the road to perdition and taking many souls with them. They don't like that. Now, and we're also, we're seeing a, a severe uh, veering off in doctrine in many, many, many areas today. And there's tremendous confusion and division. And in my opinion, we're, we're on, in a nine-inning baseball game. We're only in, 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 in the second inning on this. There are a lot of people that are really, really confused, but I think they're going to continue to be confused, but I think they're going to pick sides more in the future because they're going to make a decision in what direction they're personally going to go. And we've seen millions of people since Vatican II actually leave the church. Uh, they say over a hundred thousand clergy left the church after uh, left after Vatican II, and how many more tens of thousands never actually went into the seminary or the convent? Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing you mentioned, what what I see is nothing but connecting dots here in the form of glue. When you study other apparitions, which I did not intentionally put in the book to make it to make it about Garabandal and not go off and pick daisies, but you can see Akita Japan of bishop opposing bishop, cardinal opposing um, cardinal, priest against priest, and confrere against confrere. It would I don't know how much you hear it where you live, but I can tell you no matter who I'm with, people are talking about, frankly, what's happening in Rome. Oh, and, absolutely. And, it's, it's, and, it's, and, there, and there, yeah, there's the no way to world. avoid it now. And families and, and husband and wives are dividing over it and, and what they do and where they go to church and the way they pursue their own spirituality. And I intentionally don't, I just present data to mm -hmm. where the reader can make their own decisions. But, I, you know, when you're talking about Fatima, very few people that are into, you know, a lot of the Fatima people for many, many years, they branched out a little bit more and become open, God bless them. But they, <laughs> they had blinders open. They had blinders on for many, many, many years of what I call Fatima only. And I believe in Fatima in a major, major way. I've been there twice. I believe it. It all came true. But, you know, heaven is bigger than that. Heaven moves on. Heaven has an agenda, and Garabandal and cardinals, literally, which I have in the book, they talk about literally Garabandal being the extension of Fatima. Mm -hmm. I think and they're I all extensions, even all the, even the Medjugorje. The message in every single one of these is the same. What I have always found is that there's a magnification or an intensification of what Our Lady asks, Lord. St. Bernadette prays the rosary. So the rosary is a part of that. Our Lady, just she prayed it with Our Lady. Our Lady you know, was silent during the first part. And then you have um, Fatima, pray the rosary every day for peace and then to the war. Then you have praying you know, the rosary at Garabandal. Then you have Akita Japan, pray the rosary. It's like, it is the weapon to fight these things. And then Medjugorje, pray the rosary every day. And then it's like, but pray all the mysteries because we, more than ever, we have to be praying the rosary. And and it's our really kind of our only hope, just like we say of our Blessed Mother, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. She's connected that explicitly to the power of the rosary. So it's just an intensification. And I think, and we'll get into this a little bit later, the things that are prophesied, these, you know, miracle, a warning thing. There's, it seems to be connected to what these other secrets that the children in Medjugorje have that are pointing to similar kinds of things, but they haven't revealed the kinds of things that these seers, especially Conchita, you know, there's some a little bit more specificity. But anyway, I'm going to just well, there's, there's frankly, there's a pamphlet on, on Medjugorje and, and Garabandal, which I did not do. 
but there's a pamphlet to be done on the similarities with an mm -hmm. announcement in advance and secrets. But one thing I wanted to mention, you mentioned Fatima in continuity. Uh, very few people that I've ever spoken to are aware that the young girls at Fatima actually experienced the warning. Hmm. And uh, I have Lucia's words in the book. She literally said where she saw her life like she was looking in a mirror and she saw mm -hmm. everything in it. That's the warning. And they got very, very serious about the rosary after that. And the Blessed Mother literally showed uh, Francesco, who was nine years old at the time, hell. Mm -hmm. So if, if the Blessed Mother thinks that a child can experience those kind of images with the wisdom of heaven that she has with the created being that God creates, then uh, it, it really made Francesco much more serious about his faith and the way he spoke was well beyond his years. Mm -hmm. So that's what these things do to young people when yeah. they see heaven's agenda. Well, it's also because the, the power of the prayer of children is, is really unparalleled because of their, their purity, their innocence, uh, and that gives them a closeness to God. Um, Ted, I wanted to move on a little bit here to, uh, as we're going through the history of things, there's something that's referenced that does, isn't talked about too much, and um, hopefully you could shed some more light on it. It's what's referred to as the Night of Screams. And you could just tell us a little bit about that. And then as, as I was looking through things that you had sent me, you had alluded to it as the first night of scream. So I wasn't aware that there was more than one. So what, can you explain that? Because you were talking about a vision of hell that Our Lady show the children in Fatima, not just to scare the hell out of them, um, but to help, <laughs> you know, for the world. Yeah, uh, to, to do that and for all of us. Yeah, that's an interesting to scare the hell out of them. Well, you <laughs> called the night of screams. There were two, and uh, it happened at 10.30 p.m. on June 19, 1962, where uh, Jacinta, Jacinta, and Mary Lowley saw the visions where Russia would have dominion over the world and communism would rule Europe. Priests would go into hiding, churches would be destroyed, and there would be many martyrs. So here is now a severe message. Um, there were two. There was one the next night, but we can get into the general thing. They were so severe that the entire village actually went to uh, confession the next day. Wow. Um, not much came out immediately after what was called the Knights of Scream. You mentioned Knights. Uh, it was to June 19th, 1962. The first one was 50 minutes, and the next was three and a half hours on the 20th. So this is actually part of the more severe message, so I'll read it. So listen to how emotive things will change. Russia would have dominion over the world. That's communism, and mm -hmm. communism would rule Europe. Communism, which is why I got into the Spanish Civil War, is a major component of the messages of Garibaldi. And I make a big distinction in the book. The warning, the miracle, and the permanent sign are like three acts in the exact same play. And I don't equate any one single event immediately after or before that will happen in the world like these things because the continuity is so close to each other. Mm -hmm. But we can definitely see, I don't make any predictions on dates. I'm anathema to predicting dates because everybody that I've ever seen predict a date in my entire life of over 40 years reading this type of material, nobody's been right when you go down and absolutely nail a date. And there are people anecdotally giving time frames between the warning and the miracle as being a very brief amount of time. I don't get into that. I stay with, the, with what the girl said, that it would be no more than it, it would be with, the operative word is within. It would be within one year between the warning and the miracle. Right. Some other people anecdotally now having have that time frame as literally both happening in the same calendar the same, year, like the spring, and also in all the same calendar year, and yeah. also in an even numbered year. I put it. I put it out, but 
because the stories are out there. And it's from a very credible source, actually, Maria Sirocco, who is a great, great friend of Garabandal and knew Mary Lowley well. And I think when Mary Lowley came to the United States, I think she lived with her a period of time, either in Brockton, Mass., or in Pasadena. They were close, and Maria Sirocco, who is dead, and she said that she was told that. The answer is maybe, maybe not. Mm-hmm. And but you know so if you stick with originally what was said it's safer. All right. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get into that a little bit later because I do have some questions about that. But but um, let, let, let me finish. Where look, look how yeah on the screens where Russia would, Russia would have dominion over the world, communism would rule Europe, priests would go into hiding, churches would be destroyed, and there would be many martyrs. Now in many places of the world that's already happened. But in many places like the United States, that hasn't happened. So are we getting closer where we can see these events happening? Yes, because there's a body of data that's pointing to we're getting closer, but we're not yet there. Mm -hmm. There's still some things. And it said, um, and then the young girl said that the rivers would turn red with blood. The church would be persecuted and decimated. Its buildings will no longer exist as they once did. Professing your faith would be very difficult and the sacraments would be difficult to receive. The girls were heard crying out, stop yelling us about those things. Wait, wait. Everyone should confess. They should get ready. When it appears, when it appears all is lost, that's when heaven steps in. Mm. So I mean, look at look at the, uh, the what is being said there, and how strong something is going to happen in the world where priests will be in hiding. Now this has happened many times in history: the mm-hmm. Bolshevik Revolution, mm-hmm. the French Revolution, uh, a third of the uh, clergy in all of France left France during the French Revolution. A third stayed, and about a third were martyred. And, you know, and paid with that. And that's why Brittany grew with the Von D in, in, in that part of France. So, um, you know, we're, we still have a way to go, but we can see things moving in our direction for the fulfillment of these prophecies, for sure. And there's many more things to happen. Right. And it, it, there's a distinction, too, between Russia as a nation and the errors of Russia, which would be communism, which, would you know, it, it, it will its ultimate goal isn't necessarily um, the material, you know, physical conquering of something, which is obviously how they spread militarily. They had the power, but the West could, they could never defeat the West like that. The only way was to see the ideological subversion that we know. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that have exposed that as well, that that is their ultimate goal. And you, and one can say easily, that's exactly what's we're infiltrated with right now. That's the woke culture is simply ideological communism, and it's everywhere. And it's just, and it, we are really at this the, the point where, if it's not eradicated, like a cancer, it's it's done. But we can't eradicate it. We can't vote it out. We can't militarily really get it out. It's only what all of these apparitions have been saying. It's only through a radical return to God. Because there's no going to be there's a, there's no escaping what's going to be coming, like you can't prep yourself out of it that way unless it's spiritually. Peter, that is a critical critical point that I bang home in the book relentlessly. We are, now I spent two years in Poland after the Berlin Wall and on business, and then I spent two years in Belarus during Perestroika, Glasnost ninety two and ninety three, and what's happened in the United States is we may not have communism at the point of a gun, but we have legislated uh, communism into our life administratively. So when you see the way that this country has moved over the last several generations, in many, many respects, we actually have communism. Communism in political philosophy is simply a world without God. There's fascism, there's socialism, there's communism, there's Marxism, there's all sorts of isms out there. And they all mean different things. And Marxism is simply, you can have God in Marxism, but they don't want it. And it's a distributist mentality. Now, I went to the London School of Economics in the late 70s. 
And I, I didn't really know to the degree that it was that radical. And the symbol of the LSE is actually a turtle. And um, in, in, in England, in Surrey, England, in where, where the Fabian Society is actually um, headquartered, the stained glass window is a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> the, the turtle simply wins the race by just going slow and, and yeah. just taking ground inch by inch by inch, foot by foot, but always moving forward. And a communist, which is central to these messages, they work inside the system to the degree that they can. She said the world would be communist near these events, not just the warning of the miracle, because that's the same to me. Three acts in the same play. And they just follow bing, bing, bing. Over what period of time, nobody exactly knows, but there's thinking on it. Mm. But we're, we're looking now at the incremental encroachment of our rights taken away where God has been removed from our culture. Now, if you really want to look of how profound that was, I think you could look at the Supreme Court of the United States in 1962 and 63, which we, we, I think the uh, America, the blessing was taken off America then when we mm. removed the Bible and God from the classroom in those two events. Where, mm. you know, this, the separation of church and state has always very much been distorted by the left. But the role of communism, once they work inside the system and they can't go any further abusing the system, the next phase is they blow it up or they burn it down. And that's exactly what we saw with BLM and Antifa. Mm -hmm. You blow it up or burn it down. So they're going the next phase of destruction. And that's yep. the phase we're in now. And we're beginning to see more of that with the erosion of doctrine in the church and orthodoxy that has stood for several thousand years. Mm -hmm. There isn't any way anybody can change what scripture says. A person can have a different sociological or economic view of who Jesus was in, 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 in his agenda, of how you read scripture, but you cannot alter scripture. And with what's happening now, we're seeing a tremendous destruction of orthodoxy. Yeah, it's all coming to a head. Goodness. Um, well, to, to shift gears back to the uh, Peter, um, let me just finish. You mentioned yeah. the second night of the screen. Exactly. So, we, we, yep. so the, the other book end on that. The second night of screams was on June 20th, 1962. It's just a, an, on, the, on the vigil of Corpus Christi. The, there was another horrifying vision that lasted for three and a half hours. And Mary Lowley and, um, uh, said, we saw rivers change into blood. Fire fell from the sky. Now, um, that's me saying that that's, in essence, the message of Aki to Japan. I was going to say that's exactly that's what it said. Fire falling from heaven and something worse still, which I'm not able to reveal now, she said. Three of the girls were shown the great chastisement of fire that would come if humanity reverts to its evil ways after the grace of the great miracle. So again, after the grace of mm. the great miracle and the warning, if there's not an amendment, there is a chastisement. So it, again, it's conditional. And I think uh, if you take, uh, I put this in the realm of human nature, I think it's going to be something so fantastic that the Blessed Mother literally said the human mind is not capable of comprehending what will happen. So you want to talk about a grace, and that's why the subtitle of the book is the, the Divine Reset That Will Correct the Conscience of the World. It's so big we can't comprehend it. And she even says it. Hmm. And so the girls, the girls were saying, oh, don't let this happen. Don't let this come. May everyone go to confession first. The girls wept. Don't let this happen. Don't let this come. Forgive us. Don't let this happen. Yeah, it was, it's the same follow-up message. You, you, you alluded earlier to the fact that the major authentic, authentic apparition sites, they have the same message continually. Mm -hmm. She points to him and she speaks about an amendment of life. And then, okay, everything else is about the rubrics of the faith. But basically, she said, be good, be very good. Mm -hmm. and, and adhering to what we know, the sacramental life, mass, rosary, um, living the life, service, um, 
and confession. And, and it's the same message at all of these sites. You've, you've done a really great job uh, putting together the history uh, and, and synthesizing the story into its essential components and the messages. What I really love to do is to now uh, transition into what most people who have heard of Garamandal have heard of, and that is these prophecies that we've mentioned a little bit of that there will be a global, a worldwide warning followed by a uh, a miracle that all the world will see that would be clearly something that would be from heaven um, and then a permanent sign that's left. Right is right if nobody is right. Wrong is wrong if everybody is wrong. And believe me, in this error-infested world, what we really need is a church and an authority that is right not when the world is right, but one that is right when the world is wrong. Never in history has the prayer of the rosary been more needed to save our families, our countries, and defeat the evils of the world than now. The Fulton Sheen Institute worked closely with the Roma Rosary to develop the most unique, beautiful, and meaningful rosary that was inspired by Fulton Sheen's World Mission Rosary. This special handcrafted rosary continues Sheen's passion to support the mission of the church to evangelize the entire world. Each decade of the rosary has a different color, which corresponds with a different continent. Yellow for Asia, red for the Americas, white for Europe, blue for the nations of Oceania, and green for Africa. Each Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary comes with a set of four pure essential oil blends that have been chosen for their therapeutic and theological significance. These blends correspond to the four mysteries of the rosary. Simply choose the oil for the mystery of the day, drop a small drop in the palm of your hand, and massage the oil over the surface, being sure to catch the lava beads. You're good to go and your prayer will linger longer with these beautiful aromatic notes. Every Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary you purchase supports our mission to fight the battle for the hearts and souls of the Christian family and lead our world back to God. So visit the Fulton Sheen Institute's store and pick up your beautiful Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary today. Get one for you, your family members, and your close friends, and don't forget your pastor. Thank you so much for your prayers and your support.